Broadcasting live from the Maze Runner Romulus, this is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Seamus Connolly. And I'm Garrett Strother. And unfortunately, I guess more fortunately than anything, we are not talking about the actual Maze Runner franchise today just yet. But we are going to be diving into the brand new Alien Romulus in our main segment. Very, very excited for that. Yes, I I can't wait to get talking about it with you, Seamus. But first, we do have some news to cover, starting off with the passing of the legendary actress Gina Rollins, probably best well-known to contemporary audiences as the older version of <laughs> Rachel McAdams in The Notebook. Yes, of uh, course. But had a string of absolute... I don't know, it's transcendent performances uh, in the 70s and 80s, frequently collaborating with her husband of, I'm going to say like 30-some years, John Cassavetes. She starred in many of the films that he not only directed, but also other films that he starred in. I also believe The Notebook was uh, her son as well, and all three of their kids are in the system doing uh, acting and directing as well, I believe. I know they, their daughter, Zoe Cassavetes, is a director for sure. I'm trying to think. I don't know a ton about the family lineage there, but it would not surprise me. I mean, you know... Talented, talented group of group of folks there. So yeah, I don't have a ton of history with her, but the the few that I have seen, "Woman Under the Influence," Gloria, things like the, you know the really the really famous ones you watch when you when you hear about somebody like this. Mm-hmm. Incredible, absolutely phenomenal, and I know that there was a ton of in her early career a lot of television work, working to going on like the Alfred Hitchcock Hour and and doing things like that. I think it would be phenomenal to go back and take a look at that really early stuff too well that's where i learned about gene rollins at all was when i was a kid and my grandfather and i would watch western like old westerns and she would pop up on the occasional (laughs) virginian or have gun will travel or whatever and He'd be like, because that was where I learned a lot of my weird, obscure character actors. He'd be like, that's Gina Rollins. I'd be like, I don't know what that means, Grandpa. I'm nine. But now <laughs> but then, I do. Yeah, I was going to say that. Then you did. Then you found out. And, and, and she is an absolute, absolute talent. I've also always wanted to see she's the lead in a Woody Allen movie called Another Woman that also has Ian Holm and Gene Hackman in no it. No kidding. No kidding. So I've, I've always wanted to see that because I'm a big, I mean, Gene Rollins could elevate every single thing she was in. It's incredible. Mm. No matter how bad the material she's given, what she could do with it. So I do like really enjoy her, but I obviously am a, am a big Gene Hackman guy, a big Ian Holm guy. Of course, uh, of course. Not a big Woody Allen guy. Fair enough. Um, you know, <laughs> I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. But that sounds I, like a cast interesting yeah. enough to give something like that a shot. I mean, I mean, it, that's undeniable stuff right there. When I went to the Morricone Festival a few months ago at the Music Box in Chicago, they played a relatively obscure Italian produced gangster movie called Machine Gun McCain. Oh, starring yeah, yeah. John Cassavetes as the titular Machine Gun McCain. And Gina Rollins has like two scenes at the end of the movie that are leagues above anything else that's in that movie. <laughs> She's amazing in it. Uh, if, you've, if you've got a spare two hours to be to be shocked by the lack of machine gunning in something, that's, that's a movie <laughs> for you. That sounds delightful. But moving on to our next piece of news here, we just can't, it's another week, we just cannot stop having a Disney danger, Disney danger, of course, this really is sounding the alarm, deploying the garrison, as it were. I wish we were deploying the garrison, Seamus, because officially Disney, well, it kind of, it's, 
it's kind of official. It's official <laughs> enough that it's we up. feel that we will report on it. Um, yeah, which we yeah. usually don't just report on rumors because like cast members have come out and talked about it, even though uh, Disney, I don't think, has officially confirmed that the Acolyte will not be renewed for any additional episodes. The auxiliary content related to it is still happening. So all those books and things that were announced at D23, absolutely still on the table. But yeah, you and I... Recently, a couple weeks ago, covered the full season of The Acolyte for the show. It's something that we both quite enjoyed and were really excited to see uh, Mm. blossom into something new in season two. But apparently that will not be happening. Yeah, honestly, devastating news. I really enjoyed the first season. The once the only season of the Acolyte. On top of that, to have so many people celebrating the demise of this project, oh, like it's dude, a victory. Yeah. It really does make me sad to know that we are just, you know, we are in the spot, the Disney Star Wars spiral, probably from here on out. There. Oh, I yeah. don't. I don't think that there will be good Star Wars again after Andor is over. I kind like. I really yeah. don't think that. I think the last Jedi broke their brains. And then it was long enough that the dust settled and they were like, okay, well, maybe we'll let somebody do something cool with Star Wars again. (laughs) And then it was like, bonk, whack-a-mole. God, just... We're going to listen to the worst parts of this (laughs) fan base and not do anything uh, challenging or interesting ever again. Yeah, that is an absolute shame. And and to know that this is for sure going to influence the future of any kind of High Republic live-action projects in even fully removed from any kind of acolyte plot lines that really sucks you know i'm glad to know that the auxiliary stuff is still going down and hopefully that will lead to you know uh, an animated show uh, a video game something more something more something interesting to hold on to i think you're right that that star wars is now you know i'm I, me and you are on the andor train and then we are just riding it into the abyss after that i think <laughs> <laughs> uh the like d- down to the planet scarif off which we will definitely get uh, oh god there's there is some i would not deign to call this positive disney news but we do have an update on some really negative disney news from last week which is that disney has dropped their bid to dismiss the wrongful death lawsuit that we detailed last week on the show after a woman suffered a fatal allergic reaction at a restaurant at Walt Disney World, and Disney was initially trying to get the suit thrown out on the grounds that because her husband signed up for a trial of Disney Plus and agreed to the terms and conditions, that he agreed to arbitrate all disputes with the Walt Disney Company out of court. So they have they have stopped this initiative after massive public backlash and josh tomorrow the head of walt disney's theme park division put out a statement that was like we put humanity above all other considerations which <laughs> hear me out i think if that were true you wouldn't have, you maybe wouldn't yeah have yeah <laughs> tried to do this to begin with exactly that is that is insane now i mean it is clear that they were just never going to get a judge on their side on that kind of case uh and I know that I I believe they have not updated any of the user agreements that led to this in the first place on those uh, ticket buying and, and streaming service well, agreements. Well, why would they? Because then if, okay, let's say I'm staying in a Walt Disney World hotel and I trip and fall and I don't kill myself, you know, I'm not dead, but... I decide that I'm I'm seriously injured enough that I'm going to sue the Walt Disney Corporation. They could still be like, well, Disney Plus, Garrett, you know, just yeah. because they oh, yeah. are choosing not to use that power now doesn't mean they don't want to retain it. And here, I'm pulling up his statement now <laughs> um, <laughs> where the company really appreciates human life as a resource yeah um he says with such unique circumstances as the ones in this case we believe that it warrants a sensitive approach to expedite a resolution for the family (laughs) 
Uh, so love that. Not this in this one very specific instance where a woman died at Walt Disney World, that <laughs> uh, that I guess we maybe won't enforce the Disney Plus terms and conditions that you signed five years ago. I, I'm sure you can imagine the gesture I was making as you were reading that statement. My God, what an absolutely insincere way to say you're welcome. I guess is kind of the tone that I'm hearing there. Oh. It's Good disgusting, God. especially considering we we said this on the show last week. I think you're Disney. Just pay the guy. Like, yeah, if you want it, if you want to settle it out of court, settle it out of court. Don't get it dismissed. Yeah, Ugh. it's it's insane. I I guarantee this will this will be looked back on as like, oh, you remember the one time they like they, they went mask off a little bit for a second, and then we're gonna get to the Running Man future where they own America and we are like all in dystopia. <sighs> I mean, as somebody who recently uh, listened to your rec center from last week, Shavis, and watched The Running Man, I'm not entirely convinced we're not already there. You, you, I think, understated how prescient that movie is. It's pretty uh, yeah. crazy. It's only grown more important of a of a, <laughs> a warning for us, so I guess it's a little past due at this point, like you said. Well, we've got one last piece of news here to hit. Uh, more Disney news. Surprise, surprise, which is that the Indiana Jones video game that Bethesda is currently developing will be coming to the PlayStation 5 in spring of next year. So what is that, like about six months after it drops on Xbox and PC? Yeah, I think that's just a couple weeks from now at this point for the initial Xbox PC drop. But I, I you know, I this was a little, this was in the rumor mill for a little bit before they announced it at Gamescom uh, uh, earlier this week. So I I was just happy to see that confirmed. They really just, I don't know if you watched any of that footage, but they kind of just drop the, and then also come into PS5 like nothing I is did. happening. Yeah. It was very I funny to see. That. I, 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 I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. As somebody that has seen it time and time again, I know you, same thing for you. Seeing AAA games that are launched with absolutely game-breaking bugs, like we just are hearing the news of the new Star Wars game, just like, I hope you didn't get it on the first day it came out, because now everything's rebroken again. But <laughs> the the Garrett buying Jedi Survivor, putting it in his PlayStation, <laughs> going, okay, I'll play this in three months, and then not touching it for three more months. Exactly, but now... They're just doing it for us. The Xbox guys are beta testing our Indiana Jones game for <laughs> us, and we get the finished product. I'm very excited. Yeah, because I'm certain there will be no PS5 bugs uh, when that launches. Well, you know, uh, maybe at least the little I'm less. saying it right now. Uh, I'm taking a big <laughs> sip of my coffee as I boot up my PlayStation <laughs> in spring 2025. Uh, well, I, I have faith. I'm, I'm pretty jazzed. I'm glad I don't have to buy an Xbox for this. I'm I so know... glad I don't have have to buy an xbox <laughs> we were both because like I would. well i would exactly. buy an xbox I we were both ready to do it with the cheapest xbox that we could get to, to play this in the best way we could i'm i'm thrilled the haptic feedback on that whip crack is going to be phenomenal i'm excited i don't think the xbox controller has that kind of tech brother i'm sorry but the, it's, but it's... the playstation could do... oh right yeah, because dog. you don't have to buy an Xbox. Exactly. <laughs> Dude, I'm, Dude. I'm, how thrilled are you to remember that again right yeah, now? Incredible. Great. Oh. I do a pop culture podcast. <laughs> don't even worry about it. Uh, we are we don't talk politics on this show very often, but well, we are pro PlayStation all the way. We do not. Get, we that is our our but party. We're also not like psychos about it. We're not like oh I no does no. this suck to not have Spider Man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, oh yeah. Well, if we, we were if we this podcast celebrate... existed like uh, ten years ago, we would have to appeal to the MLG uh, listener yeah. base and and go with that. We celebrate more people being able to play a game that they want to play yes. that is i think our bottom line and, and today those people include us Thank so good for goodness us. yes and good for everybody else good for good for america <laughs> good for that's the what world. i have to say yes. about that. god bless sam the eagle somewhere <laughs> save save him up in vision 3d <laughs> Say, uh, say you heard it here first. Well, you this is this. Yeah, no, it won't be. You know, this is the second episode going. we're doing this. But <laughs> save Muppet Vision 3D. Save Muppet Vision 3D. Quote Pop Culture Reference Podcast. But I think without further ado, it's time to play the music. It's time, time to, to... to acid the blood. <laughs> 
uh, it's time to get things started here on Alien Rom You Lust. That is exactly where I was hoping you would cram that rhyme in. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. It yeah. doesn't make sense. I don't. Th- <laughs> For today's main segment, we are going to be talking about Fede Alvarez's brand new entry into the Alien franchise, Alien Romulus. I'm so curious to to hear what you think about this, Garrett. What 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 did you think? Pre spoilers, right right off the bat. What what are you thinking about this new one? So you and I have been excited about this since they dropped the first trailer, and we learned that Alvarez was attached back. What would that have been? Sometime in the spring. I would imagine. Yeah, something like that. And uh, I gotta say, I thought it was fine. I was not as satisfied as I expected to be going into it. I think that it doesn't have a lot of its own ideas. And unf- and the ones that it does have that are interesting are not explored in any kind of way that I think, like, that is deserving of the interest I have in the idea as I also think that, ironically, I th- I was underwhelmed by the gore in this. I, when you really? Get the the you get the guy who's like you know the the super gory Evil Dead remake and all this stuff. I exp- and put him in a famously visceral gory franchise. I was really expecting more from it. I. Gotta say, I was pretty satisfied with the gore. I think that a lot of the a lot of the carnage that we see on screen was very upsetting. I don't know. I'm usually the gore guy. I, we're, we're, this is kind of a flip flop of what we usually are, you know. But I was so taken aback by how nasty so much of this movie was. But I, I'll say there's some stuff towards the end of the movie that I wish the rest of the movie had been on the level mm. of. In, okay. How's that? You know, I would. I'm very excited again because i think i know exactly what you're talking about but still pre-spoilers i think i have to agree that there was a lot of interesting ideas and i as a defender of many alien sequels that are not necessarily the most heralded in the franchise i i still thought this was very good i i think it's in the top half of the alien franchise and i know that's not saying a ton considering, you know, some of the depths that we get to, especially if you include, like, Alien versus Predator and things like that. Oh, but sure. I, I feel like there was too uh, at once too much focus on the human characters and then not enough follow-through on any of the individual things I found interesting about any of these characters. Well, yeah, I think that's... that's let's, let's put it all out in the open. Uh, the characters in this are not interesting. Except for the main two. Yes, absolutely. And Alien is a franchise that is known for its colorful cast of fleshed out cannon fodder. And there was a moment in this movie where we were heading to the destination where we are going to spend the majority of the runtime. And I looked around and realized that, yeah, this is, I guess, the cast that we have for this movie. Uh, and I wish I had been right about that, because unfortunately, when they get where they're going, there's also the ghoulishly resurrected Ian Holm AI deepfake, which I yeah, absolutely hated. I think that I would have been a lot more lenient on this movie as a fun time at the at the summer movies, which it is, if it had not had that element. And... When we get into spoilers, I think it's even... I will explain that I think it's even stranger that they chose to bring that to the table when there would have been a more thematically and character resonant choice, I think, to have have filled that role. I am very curious about what that means, because I think we might have... Very, very similar thoughts on this subject. Because, yeah, I... uh, I think it's almost like the movie's pointing to it and then just doesn't do it. So, I would not be surprised by that. Anyway, (laughs) you you were saying. I... Overall, I still very much enjoyed this movie. I thought it was very frightening. I I think the gore was really solid. It was making my skin crawl in a lot of places. The central characters that we've been alluding to... uh, Kaylee Spaney's character... And 
David Johnson, David Johnson from the the Hulu rom com Rye Lane, which everybody should go check out on <laughs> on sure. Hulu because he's great in it and he was great in this. Yes, absolutely. I can't I can't say that about the other thing uh, that I have yet to see, but I thought that he was really really good in in this movie. I don't know if I can say the same about pretty much any other character in the movie. I didn't necessarily think that they were very interesting, and the ones that were more interesting than the others were not necessarily very likable in, in the movie yeah. at all. So I, I again, that goes back to wishing that they sprinkled a little bit more for each of these characters, or at least the ones that were the interesting ones instead of kind of making them more forgettable than they should be. And again, it's a, it's a horror movie. They're going to get picked off in whatever fashion in in this franchise famously, but I, I want to care a little more like I do in, I would say every other Alien sequel that I've seen really has a leg up on at least making me be like, oh no, not that guy, even if I don't even like remember their name. I think of the remaining cast members, the one that stood out to me the most was Isabel Merced, Maybe that's because I have a pre-existing affinity for her, uh, having seen her in things like Dora the Explorer and enjoyed oh, her. <laughs> that's um, who that is, huh? Yeah, that's Dora. That's interesting. Interesting. Um, I I gotta say though, I don't think that anything with her character was interesting. I did. I thought she was totally underwritten. I think any commendation for that role goes all the way to her performance. Mm. Yeah. For, I mean, truly some of the smallest amount of screen time for somebody that I yes. would have loved to have been maybe part of the main crew here instead of like somehow sidelined from the moment that sh her character was introduced. Um, Literally. I don't even under yeah. I, to the point that I'm perplexed and I know why she's in the movie structurally. Sure. I am perplexed but... that that character even made it to the screen in in the stage that she was like it almost seems like they cut her character but forgot to cut her out of a few key scenes <laughs> yeah yeah that that seems to be the case unfortunately and i you know i'll still see more alien sequels as, as you know as long as they come out and i you know me and you both still have a handful to catch up on at least I know that much, but I I hope that it's not a trend that we see more of this. I, I heard very good things about Fede Alvarez's Evil Dead reboot, sequel, whatever you want to call it. It's and a remake. It's a straight remake. It, that's the, the straight movie. remake. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I You know, and I, I, I would maybe even see another Alvarez alien movie if that is something oh, that would yeah. uh, happen in the future. I just Boy. hope that these characters, you know, they get a little, they get a little something to eat at the table here. <laughs> Not to get ahead of ourselves, one of the big problems I had with this movie is by the time it turned into a movie I wanted to watch, it was over. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think, I think that is probably fairly intentional from some of the interviews that I've read about. I suspect so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, and that I don't hate. Like I said, I, I would be happy to see. Alvarez at the helm for another one if that was the next one or down the line we get a little bit of a continuation I, I would be pretty happy about it regardless uh, again the crux of my issue here is in the my investment in the characters yes. I really outside of Kaylee Spaney and David Johnson's two leads didn't find any of them compelling I was annoyed most of the time that they were on screen because you've got Let's just break it down real quick. You've got Kaylee Spaney's ex-boyfriend, who is boring. Um, unfortunately got, for him. Unfortunately for him. That actor seems like he would be, like, a charismatic... Like, I I don't blame... I don't... I Actually, that's not exactly true. I do blame the cousin. So then... So Spike there's the Fern. love interest... Is, do you, is this a guy? Do you know this guy? I just, I've just, I had to look into him a little more, I think. I, I don't think I know him from anything else, but uh, having, like, a Cockney uh, accent on a, on a character named Bjorn, I was just like, what are, what are we doing here? I gotta, I gotta figure something out. I couldn't understand a word that he said 
That is and, another th- okay. I'm glad you said that. I I thought that I was just being uh so and I pride myself for being able to decipher many accents spoken in the king's English. But Seamus, we know oh, about your famed Anglophobia. That is- <laughs> yeah, listen, listen. We're not gonna get. This isn't my political podcast. I'm getting canceled <laughs> for on the side. Okay, this is this is our main segment here. But man, I was like. I was almost like, I should have gone to the subtitle screening of this movie. I, I could have maybe actually used that. Okay, I'm going to round off the cast real quick. But yes, then please, we'll keep please. laying into this poor Spike. <laughs> Did you say his name was Spike? Spike Fern? Awesome. He, he was apparently awesome name. maybe the guy who was getting beat up on the L tracks in the beginning of the Batman that guy, I, that guy, I don't want to be this. That guy's Asian, Seamus. Well, okay, maybe he was one of the guys beating. <laughs> he's just, he's just credited as like a vandal or whatever in the Batman. I assumed that he was sure, some kind okay. of some criminal. Is he the graffiti guy in that oh, opening maybe? montage? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. What it he truly... apparently was in the Batman. <laughs> it really um, doesn't. So, in addition, we have Isabel Merced, who is the ex-boyfriend's pregnant sister. And then you have the bald pilot woman who is maybe supposed to be the cousin's girlfriend. That's kind of implied, but also I wasn't really clear on the whole. Their dynamics were not made clear. They have one scene at the beginning, the real like when you meet all the characters, and it's an awful scene. It's the worst scene in the movie. And because of that, the rest of the movie suffers. It's weird. It feel it has an odd tone. They're all young, and when you are in the midst of the movie, it's not clear why they're all young. It's just, it feels like, okay, alien, but, like, it's the Maze Runner. Yeah, and... I, I thought they were all, like, <laughs> we get to that scene that you're referencing there where we kind of get a bigger feel of the group that we're going to be following for this movie, and I was like, it's interesting that all of these 15 year olds are gonna gonna do this adventure and then it's like oh they're like in their 20s and it's just feels weird i like i don't really i i didn't love i didn't love that i really i really didn't so i read an interview with alvarez after i saw the movie and he talked about how in the special edition of aliens putting money in my aliens swear jar (laughs) um he was really fascinated by the scene where they go to Hadley's Hope and you see all the kids that are being raised on this mid-terraforming planet. And he was like, what would it be like to spend your whole life living on this awful, sunless world? And what would happen when you were finally old enough and you grew up and you're trying to get out from under that world? What a great idea. Wish any of that were in the movie. Man, Um, yeah. Like, the only scene that I feel like captures that is there's a scene towards the beginning where I, like, Kaylee Spaney's character does have a moment of like, oh, I'm kind of finally, you know, getting free of the life that uh, I've been living. And we needed a scene that explained that, dare I say, I hate to say this because I hate when movies do this. (laughs) Dare I say it would have been nice if the movie opened with, like, them as kids or something. You know? Like, anything to give me a little bit more dimension <laughs> to their dynamic. Yeah, I, I'm i definitely going to get into more of the very beginning, probably when we get to spoilers, but I could yeah. have watched a whole movie of the intro of this movie, you know? Like, I think that there was a lot of interesting stuff that is really only dabbled in in the entire Alien franchise that I thought would have been really fascinating to delve a little deeper into instead of just like, you know, we're off to the races, we're, we're going right into the adventure pretty pretty swiftly when I'm not ready to leave the other stuff that I find interesting yeah. with the people that I don't find interesting yet. Yeah. It, it really rushes us right along. But despite all of that, I think that there are several sequences in this movie that are really inventive and like some of there are moments where you can tell that this is something that the filmmakers have been thinking about for years and were like if I got to do an alien what cool twist would I put on it and I loved that I loved the moments where you could see that happening and that they are just unfortunately a little few and far between and again involve a lot of characters that i don't necessarily care about whether they live or die yeah 
that is really the the saddest part of this is that I I enjoyed the hell out of it, but it could have been truly it could have been top three in the Alien. Well, maybe the third in the top three of the Alien franchise if it it gave us a little bit more of that. And I I would really love to to dive into more of the specifics with you if you think you're ready for it. I I do. I think you know we've said our piece. Good time at the movies. Uh, but but check your expectations at the door a little bit and also uh gross in home just yeah I, yeah just an actual bummer for real just a real it just and it like and here's the other thing and this this is gonna sound awful because i'm against it just generally it doesn't look good either so there's that exactly okay all right maybe that's where we start should we should we this is the threshold maybe for us yeah, to really get farther threshold into. here we go uh, Ian Holm, <laughs> Ian Holm Rook is his is his character's name, but he is clearly just a copy paste of his character in Alien. I will say Rook, though, good name in keeping with the chess names from like Bishop and the Queen from the rest of the franchise. For Rook sure, is the is the science officer on the space station. He's a, the the on the fortress, you know, the rook is the castle mm. in chess. So, anyway, I did think that that was a smart naming convention even if I disagree with it having the likeness of Ash. And I mean, the, maybe one of my biggest problems or maybe why it felt worse is that there are are moments when they come across the the bisected body of Rook. That has been, you know, melted away by alien blood or torn to shreds, whatever you want to say. And they, like, have this real human-sized, well, torso-sized, I guess, puppet animatronic that they have for a lot of the movement for Rook. And they keep him in the shadows, and it's very clear, you know, who it's supposed to be or what it's supposed to be, rather. And I was like, oh, maybe this isn't going to be as much of an actual nightmare as it could be. And then, bam nothing but stark white lab lighting for the rest of that character and it just looks like crap it, it like besides how ghoulish and nasty it feels it looks like a snapchat facetune it's like not it cool. does and honestly i think i would have been a lot cooler with it if the part that you're describing of shadow obscured silhouette of a guy that looks vaguely like ian holm mm. were like because I had no idea that that synthetic was going to be such a big part of the plot of oh the movie God, and be yeah, an actual seriously. character in the movie. Because the second I, we came across him, like you're saying, I was like, oh yeah, okay, so Ian, we're doing Ian home, I guess. And if they had just had that one little moment where he like lunges at her and then she gets the, the ship out of his neck and he's all in shadow, that would have been fine with me. Totally. I, I don't even necessarily think it would have been in poor taste. I think, it, you know, whatever. But... When there are so many other options, including the still living Lance Henriksen, that you could, if you just need that fan service plug, I I really don't understand why you would do this. I mean, I do understand why you would do it, is because Disney's obsessed with this technology and they like nostalgia bait, and that's what it is. But I just think it's so gross, and I guess this is the time to get into what which one of us should share our theory that might be the same theory or not theory, but our, our alternative suggestion first, Seamus. Oh, oh, of how they, this would be handled. Well, much like you, I thought the Rook, you know, jump scare lunge might have potentially in a perfect world have, would have been the end of that. And they would have, the idea of Andy, the Android brother of rain, Mm-hmm. adopting this, you know, quote-unquote upgrade where the mannerisms of Rook or Ash or whatever Ian Holm bought from the original was going to be more integrated into that Andy character and that he was going to become the de facto bad guy. They, you know, they brought him along as a tool to use up and throw away to get these cryopods and he was never part of the survival equation. So then suddenly you have... Ian Homebot's microchip in his neck, and that that new Prime Directive, that new uh, Wayland Utani sponsored objective that he has to work with, was going to be a little bit more sinister. In in fact, instead of 
you know, it was still it was still fairly sinister the way that they did it, but it was more like in a calculated way. There was redeeming factors to what Andy was doing after his update, but and y- you could still have your your shadowy Ian Holm moment where they where they're getting the chip, but then it would just it would evolve past it. We would have a little bit more of a dynamic with this android that I don't again still being one of the best characters of the whole movie could have been even greater emphasized by a, a, a mid movie twist like that so while i was watching the film that was definitely what i was thinking like oh yeah we're on when the same he got the micro <laughs> yeah. yeah but i do i will say that i do have a slightly different avenue to go down if you will entertain it please yes if you still want to have rook and we can just keep him as rook right be a character and and talk to them and be up on the table and all this stuff. Andy, it's established in dialogue, is a very prolific model of synthetic. And the station that they are on, the Renaissance, obviously, which I, you and I, neither of, we had to look up because neither of us remembered from from the movie itself, obviously renaissance rebirth trying Mm -hmm. to bring back the xenomorph that is an easy that's an easy pick there but the station is divided into two sections romulus and ramus twins from roman mythology and i was like why would you not have in your movie that has this romulus and ramus thing that it barely uses as any kind of thematic device not have your established prolific android model have a twin on the station. You have Andy that still works, and you have messed up Andy, and then they can have all these conversations. Those two characters, because they're androids, already have this connection already, and we clearly see that David Johnson has the chops to handle that kind of versatility. Why is it Ian Holm at all? I was shaking my head that entire time you were speaking that is actually phenomenal and an honest to god missed opportunity i think you're right that they barely touch on the uh romulus ramus imagery symbology there it's it's so surface level on pretty much all of it but it's just like we need it it, you might as well have named the two sides of the station goofus and gallant like (laughs) it's like it's just, oh, we need two things, Bert that, and Ernie, you know. Uh, that is, man, that uh, should be the next one, maybe? Like, that. <laughs> I mean, they've wasted that opportunity pretty much entirely, but holy moly, that's phenomenal. Plus, then you could have more, like, I really liked more sinister, company-oriented Andy. I loved yeah. his turn to, like, super competent, running, and moving like a honest to god android like he was on that and i that would have been such an interesting such an interesting dynamic to have because you know we always have our android characters in i want to say every alien maybe not alien 3 it's been a minute but i i as a person who has not seen alien 3 believe that bishop is still in it to some degree to some degree to some degree, I don't want to get. We'll watch. We'll watch that, my friend. We will. But I, I, in more of a central role, we have a, we have an android with goals. You know, in in yeah. every single other alien sequel, well, I guess except, maybe I would argue, except for B- Bishop. I mean, like, sure, he's smart and he is helpful and he ha- he has his own ideas and whatever. Bishop has no agenda other than do what Ripley tells him to do, really, for most of the I guess that, that is true. Uh, that is true. And also having just rewatched Aliens is in way less of that movie than I remember, for sure. Because he's so good and so memorable, but this is uh, putting more money in the Aliens <laughs> Well, I that one's on me. I, I was the one bringing this up. But that Bishop takes action. He is somebody who is doing things that matter tremendously true. in the plot. True. He's and, crawling through a tiny little pipe that's a nightmare. Yeah. Oh, God. Unlocking childhood claustrophobia in a movie. I shouldn't have been watching young enough to unlock childhood anything. But, you know, <laughs> to have such a central android character like Andy in Romulus here and not take advantage of more of an android v. android interaction on something like a, you know, a successfully 
quote unquote successfully terraformed planet or this clearly abandoned space station like there's so much room to have that kind of interaction and that would have just bolstered Andy even higher as probably one of if not the best characters in this movie it would just given more it would just been interesting for God's sake give us some more interesting character things absolutely and while we're still on Romulus and Ramus the only thing that I and this is kind of jumping to the end I guess the only thing that I caught that was more explicitly tied to the myth of Romulus and Ramus is they are very frequently depicted as two infants suckling at the breast the, of a wolf. Yes, the wolf mother. And there's a moment in this at the at the very end, which we're really getting into, and we can't get into this right now because that'll be the whole rest of the Oh my segment. god, I know, yeah, yeah. When the, the, the new creation, the xenomorph human, I mean, they're all xenomorph human hybrids, but the, like, one that looks like a guy. I, um, and, and this is why is, we're gonna really get into it later, of course, but yes, please go on. Is eating question mark Isabella Merced and that does have a, a feeling of the like like the the Romulus and Ramus and this it like it has a there is some suckling imagery there I feel like we oh, see for sure we yeah eating her chest you know like yeah she, she um, uh, checks herself after giving birth in the most horrific way I've ever seen ever and it's she's like lactating alien goo that yep, seems exactly. to be the thing that they're mm-hmm. that it's after. So all that to say, I feel like that like and that is an image that is at home in in aliens iconography, I think. But man, if that was the only thing that you got out of the Romulus and Ramus and who knows, I'm sure there are things that I'm missing. There might be deleted scenes or deleted moments in the script that better harness the power of the namesake but i think it was just totally like it almost feels like they came up with okay we want to name the movie alien romulus let's work backwards about how we <laughs> do that oh uh, yeah yeah there again there could have been very legitimate cool things to do with two halves of a single dying space station you know the idea of like Romulus, this empire maker, this, you know, the founder of Rome itself, the big, the, you know, the greatest empire in human mm-hmm. history or whatever. And, and I, you know, you could, I guess, chalk that up to more of like the, the lesser of two brothers, the classic xenomorph being bested yeah. versus like this, uh, this You've also- disgusting thing that is clearly yeah. supposed to be the, the Prometheus inspiration, like the thing that old handsome Squidward alien wanted all along, you know? You also got, I guess, again, this is, I think this is honestly giving the movie a little bit too much credit. <laughs> we're, we're, we're digging into it, it, yeah. You know, th- there is a little bit of, in the story of Romulus and Ramus, like, man is the real villain, you know? And <laughs> that's obviously at home with Alien as well, because what a awful neutered version of Alien's normally pretty articulate political commentary of just like, man, these kids are indentured servants, huh? All right, well, we did that scene. Let's go do a horror movie now. Uh, and that's what, that, that's what I was, you know, I was trying to communicate a little bit of pre-spoilers is like, give me, give me the Apple TV Plus limited series about these kids on the colony before they're like, well, let's just jet off to the space station that the company is not worried about for some reason and at all even though it holds their most precious scientific secrets it's insane to me i the whole crux of the okay you okay hold on are we about i'm to, about i'm about to have a moment here <laughs> no, let's, that I, please no because i'm i'm probably thinking the exact same thing as you well i'm thinking about the goonies is what i'm thinking about and you brought up this is the goonies <laughs> but alien and the exact same logic that brings you to yeah, there's a pirate treasure in caves underneath this suburb is, oh, yeah, this giant space station that's going to crash into the planet that has a ton of valuable assets that that went missing from the Wayland dutani Corporation that we have shown uh, in this very movie, in fact, is willing to go to their destitute 
uh, potentially unsafe locations and harvest anything of any value that they can. Oh yeah, they're just going to let it crash into this giant ring of a, a planet and not have to worry about any of the other stuff going on. Sure. Like, what? I don't... <sighs> yeah. I yeah. don't understand... And I can overlook that. It's it's movie logic to a certain degree. And if the rest of the movie didn't have the problems, it could really iron over that pretty easily. Especially because we get some really cool sequences out of its eventual crashing into the rings of the planet. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I just don't think it makes any sense. It, it, it doesn't make me as Ill irrationally angry as the Goonies logic lapse does, but... Uh, I also don't think the Goonies has a cool uh, <laughs> sequence where they float through through the air in the zero G to avoid all the alien acid blood. So you know, <laughs> yeah, that is that is something that I've always said that the Goonies has lacked, and you could quote me on that. <laughs> I, I Data should have a gadget <laughs> that that punches out of his chest, and and it's a fan that blows the alien blood away from the, them. <laughs> Data's oil slick shoes are just spraying alien acid blood into dude's <laughs> chest. And just having him die in shock as he watches his hands melt. Perfect. Yeah, correct. God. See, I, I was so upset by that, by the way. I, I know we do a lot of acid stuff in this franchise, but I was just like, I've never watched a man watch himself really dissolve slowly like that. You know, like, for whatever the, reason, the hand good. bones and the... <laughs> Just, like, him knocked back watching his own heart get dissolved or whatever. I, man, that sucked. Because credit to Spike Fern, I, I was so, I was so ready to watch that guy die. It oh, is yeah. crazy. For because sure. I, I already didn't like him bullying Andy, but then on top of that, me just being pissed the entire time he was on screen because I couldn't understand him and I thought he was the most annoying out Dude. of the cast of annoying characters. Yeah. I please <laughs> slowly dissolve from from the acid cocoon uh, discharge uh, oh and watch Lord. yourself die as your cousin who you may be impregnated runs oh, away. Okay, for sure, right? Like, am I crazy? They, he well, references, okay. the main guy's like, that's my sister. And then he's also like, I'm sorry about my cousin. He's a jerk. And then it's yep. so very clear from the second that the pregnant sister says... Oh, oh, she's like, oh, who's the father? And she's like, oh, it's just some jerk. I was like, oh, so it's the yeah. jerk that we know in the movie then. Exactly, the one the the one guy <laughs> the that one is guy not her brother in this movie, or, or a robot. Um, Who he is racist towards, I guess, because of his dead mom, which is another thing they Listen. explain away instantly. It's crazy yeah. that they didn't go back to that. I'm fine with alien racism, or uh, with... I'm fine android. with android racism. <laughs> Obviously, that's like a part of the Alien franchise. Of course. But, man, do anything interesting with it other than... Do, like, again, it feels like Will Poulter from the Maze Runner <laughs> is just on this ship <laughs> bullying this wow. kid. I would have loved... No, he's too old now. <laughs> Never mind. He would have been like the yeah, old man in the group. He's over 30, <laughs> so... That's a oh, no-go. You know, that that would have added a little something-something to the mix here, you know? there's there's It's just missed opportunities left and right. So, I was glad to watch him die. It made me happy. I did not care about his weird pilot girlfriend that died immediately um, at all. She's on the poster. Sick poster. Yeah, you know? there's an incredible maybe one of the most upsetting face hugger shots where the whole like impregnation tube is slithered out of her throat as they get it off of her i uh, didn't love that at all i i no. found out that they did that practically with a lot of lube and that she had to deal with that which is the most horrible thing i've ever heard if there's one thing the Alien movies love, it's having a bunch of lube on the set. Lube they are, and they shredded just condoms. Get enough. <laughs> they really can't. They really can't. Unless it's them trying to showcase uh, a classic xenomorph for more than like ten seconds in this movie. You know. Yeah, I don't know. I did. I kind of thought there was. The pacing of this movie was odd to me. Um, mm -hmm. In that I was bored during parts of it. Again, maybe that could have been solved by having character that we're just gonna come back to that. We're gonna <laughs> Every... <rebel. laughs> yeah, that's the new jar next to the aliens jar. Oh, sorry, I said it. You gotta put more money in there. My bad. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, by the way, just so you know, I am doing a gesture of putting money in the jar every time <laughs> I say it. You're putting your company credits into each jar whenever we have to. 
because I think this movie uses face hookers really well. Um, I think he he's really close to doing something cool with the chest burster that I ultimately was underwhelmed by because the second again going back to our to our to our bald pilot friend, the second she finds that X ray gun thing. Dude. Dude. I was like, oh, cool, chest burster, awesome, yeah. I'm I'm ready for that. And then they show it for, like, two seconds. They don't even show, they, the, the chest bursting doesn't even actually happen while they have the x-ray behind her. And then I think that the actual bursting of the chest, that's one of the parts where I'm like, I don't think that's anywhere near as visceral as the ones from the first two movies. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want it to be. Or Prometheus, for that matter. I uh, that that that's the biggest thing that this movie has told me is that I need to go back and rewatch Prometheus, not just for the lore stuff, just because I also remember legitimately enjoying Prometheus, and there were characters that I I cared about um, beyond a few seconds of yeah, very shallow personalities being shown. You know, I I think that everything. I, I mean, I even I was a little bending the ribs the wrong way shot uh, however brief it was in this i still thought it was very visceral and i would have liked a little more of that visceral nature it's like the most horrific thing in the world when you watch alien and you see yeah. that bursting through the white t-shirt that that homeboy has on but it just it's too quick the x-ray like you were saying does not stick around that should have been like and I know there's already a, a good many moments of the thing in this, which is, there's I mean, so much the I mean, thing in this, but it's, like to have that it, x-ray thing to be like, this is our blood test. This is the thing we're going to check everybody with all the time to make sure that we're all unaliened right now. Mm -hmm. I, it's just out the window. She, she, it's, it's just never heard from again. Yeah, because I mean, obviously the thing, I don't know who's on record about what about this. I don't. It, this is speculation. Is I'll put down the for my boys John Carpenter and Kurt Russell. <laughs> I will put down that blanket. But the thing is obviously influenced by Alien, right? Yeah, I mean, surely. And I mean, it, uh, body horror. Oh, yeah. Somebody among us is not what they seem. We're stuck in a remote location Absolutely, where we can't get yeah. out. There's flamethrowers. We're going through tunnels. Like there's so much Alien in the thing. And I think that then this movie structurally has a lot in common with the thing, mm -hmm. except that the thing is perfect and this is <laughs> fine. Oh um, man, that intro of Romulus where they're literally doing the thing, where they're like cracking yeah. the meteorite, which I mean, yeah. whatever, I won't look into that that far, you know, of the, the original alien being somehow intact and in like carbonite or whatever. Yeah, I didn't. I thought we were really maybe going to get an explanation for that, and I know we were just on the show last week praising how Alien is not interested in answering our questions, but I don't know, if you're going to go back to the original Alien and just be like, oh yeah, like, and also yeah. the Alien was like uh, in like a meteor that is its own it's it made a shell around itself or something yeah however that works i mean yeah they should have i maybe... mean who knows that might be something from alien covenant that i just don't have any idea about um, oh yeah that's true that's that's the one that we mutually have no knowledge of yes. i believe i think that's the only one which they do prometheus shout out in this movie like a weird like explicitly prometheus oh summit. like they're yeah the oh, e yeah. Holmes literally like hey you guys see prometheus and then the prometheus you remember that black goo plays. from prometheus <laughs> let's let, you remember that guy's face from prometheus let's put him on a 10 foot tall basketball player and have him chase you around yeah. oh goodness okay is it time is let's it time? talk about maybe the most upsetting creature design i've seen in years that weird hybrid pregnancy alien uh, prometheus thing is horrific i loved it and i hated it and it, it was i mean it's not classic xenomorph is classic xenomorph of course mm -hmm. but this was such a you know it's not the predalien or whatever that we have to worry about it's like true unique yet familiar nightmare fuel i i thought it was insane horror movies for the last what 15 years have figured out that there is, there is a lot of resonance in the scariest thing in the world for some reason is a tall pale guy and you know and what <laughs> <laughs> this is not an exception to that rule i don't no. think because holy crap it's horrifying i mean like alien again a thing we just got done talking about 
on last week's show is while the creature design is interesting and beautiful and yeah it is scary but it's more scary in a fascinating way this is scary in a like i'm looking (laughs) in my my dark bathroom door when i'm going to bed at night and being like oh i hope that that giant horrifying thing oh. doesn't walk out of the dark like he did in the movie Alien Romulus <laughs> and that is that's true that's a true testament to great creature design and his whole reveal is built up so well because again the 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 least complaining about gore that I have to do in this movie is of course Isabel Bellamer says like insides just spilling oh, out of her birth canal dude. as she exudes the, and she's like a couple months pregnant maybe and then once she injects herself with the xenomorph goo and like it is immediately in labor with yeah the, like you said the the engineers from prometheus and a xenomorph as the most terrifying thing just oh, like it's goodness. it's designed in a way where i'm like Turn that off. Like that's not even okay to <laughs> yeah. look at. It's so and I and for the small amount of screen time, you know, it's our it's our second half of the third act extra horror movie reveal of you're not safe, you're not going in the pot. Yeah. I mean, we knew that going Which, in. She injected yeah. herself before all that, didn't tell anyone. And it's whatever. especially like with Alien, especially, there's always the fake out at the end yes. and you've got to do one last thing. But then just, like, uh, you're throwing on your reverse-the-thing nitrogen fuel flamethrower, and you're I running that around. Cool. I I liked it a lot. Yeah, even... Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things they introduced early on that I was like, oh, we're coming back for sure to this this bad boy right here. But, man, what a what a horrifying couple of moments running around in, like, the, the mining deposit cargo bay where they're just in sand and having that thing right up in your face it's quality horror filmmaking right there i think that the last 20 minutes of this movie should have been the second half of this movie yeah not just because so much we haven't even said this explicitly but i think it's the only thing that people are saying so it almost just like a given this totally plays as a like alien franchise greatest hits playlist oh, yeah, with a few sure. cool ideas thrown in and that was the first thing in this movie that really got me excited for it as an original concept and an evolution of the alien franchise and again despite it i think being really effective and really cool and i wish i liked the rest of this movie as much as i like the last 20 minutes they don't really get to explore it a lot because it's in and out so quickly But things like, instead of blasting it out the airlock, the promise of, like, this is, this goes all the way back to the first alien, the promise of the acid blood tearing into the hole and sending you down into space, and that being the way you blow this thing out of the airlock, quote unquote, is a super great idea, then followed up with a very effective jump scare. Uh, as she's climbing oh my back God, up yeah. the rope towards the ship. Yeah. And, Good and stuff. Also, I mean, just the idea, like, the the newest evolution of how can we kill something more than anything ever has been killed? And it's putting it in the blender of a, a planet's rings that are shredding the mm-hmm. space station that you see in the distance. Very incredibly well done. And I mean, like... At this point, <laughs> that thing's gonna pop back up in a meteorite or whatever in the next movie. Uh, there's gonna be so like there, nothing dies apparently, even if you kill it the most ever. But again, we go off into the stars maybe to see rain one day again. She's got the vials of goo. We know that yep. there is a planet that may or may not be paradise that we don't ever get to really know if she'll make it there without running into any, you know, company corpo soldiers who are tracking her Andy or something like that. This is made in buff money that I think it will get a sequel. And what kind of approach are they going to have to that? Is it going to be Grapes of Wrath, Paradise is a lie. You get to the place that you think is your ultimate escape that you sacrificed everything to get to and it's actually just as bad as the place you left that would certainly be you know the easy route to Mm. take 
but like I enjoy Andy and Rain enough that I will follow them wherever they're going. That's the thing. I'm into continuing with these characters. I'm into the vibe that this movie built. I just really wish it had more of its own stuff to say and ding ding more money in the more money in the characters are boring jar, but <laughs> uh, yeah, you know dude that i i i can't agree with you enough though like you're not alone in that i wanted i wanted more and i hope we get more i hope we get our second andy i hope they don't pull ripley lines that haven't canonically been spoken out loud for oh. another 45 years oh, which really okay. bugged me like what yeah. was that all about i've i've yeah, I've got real I've got real problems with that actually. I'm glad you yeah. brought that up because I would have forgotten. Because okay, I can't I'm forget, fine. my friend. I'm fine with actually I prefer the the term artificial human myself. He's a I prefer uh, I'm fine with I can't lie about your chances. Sure, uh, yeah, but you do but have, you have my, have sympathies. my sympathies. Those are fine because those are those are programmed androids exactly. it makes sense that they would have like these sayings in their rolodex right? pre-written company uh, android vocab you know that that clocks but get away from her you you th- which i almost would have liked more because they have him stutter on on bitch and it's played for laughs sure whatever i do think it is kind of funny to have the stuttering character say his his cool badass line and have to stutter through it but I almost would have preferred if they left it as just get away from her. That would have been... But then the exact language that also doesn't make... Like, why is the xenomorph a bitch? The xenomorph queen is a bitch because yeah, she's a g- woman. And, like, like very is, and I, personally yeah, like, vindictive in Aliens, mm-hmm. you know? Like, that's like a grudge being held at that point. And it's just, like, this is just a random xenomorph that of all the others i'm sure it's the one that survived you throwing the elevator at it i guess or whatever i guess but but... it's not one that you have personal attachment to exactly like you're saying it's not threatening your daughter that it's been trying to get for the last 20 minutes of the movie it's it's not a callback that makes sense i don't under this isn't predator we don't need to have and also in Predator, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Makes sense situationally every time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's not just a lazy callback that's inserted for fan service. It's generally a turning point in that movie instead of just, like, clap because you know what the thing is, which is, I'm pretty sure that's Disney's new business model. If you if you go to their homepage, I, it's on, on the banner. I um, believe it, and I believe that they're making absolute bank from it. So I can't, I can't even necessarily blame them for thinking that that's the right way to go, because people will agree with it. And the other thing, and I was really scared at the beginning here, in like the first 10 minutes... There is one shot, not just one scene, but one shot. You have a dippy bird on the table, and you have an android offering cornbread, like the Wayland yutani <laughs> hardtack rectangle of cornbread, uh, to one of the humans. And it's just like, I was so like, ah, oh, this is going to be the whole movie, and I'm going to want to die. And I mean, not to mention I'm that she's of... she's also eating like the weird oatmeal mush out of the clear yeah. rectangular container, like an alien as well. So they they were really laying it on thick right at the beginning. Once again, and even the cor- I can I can kind of forgive the cornbread in the same breath that I forgive that I prefer artificial human and, and stuff like that because sure. he's the robot da, 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 and it's Wayland yutani prescription cornbread, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Dippy bird, I, that always reads in the first alien to me as just like the Hawaiian shirt or the way that they've all decorated their spaces in the cockpit is okay. We're on this awful lifeless spaceship how are we gonna bring some personality to mm-hmm. it individually and now it reads as oh Waylon Lu- yutani gives everybody dippy birds for some reason <laughs> and <laughs> i just i don't know it makes the i'm gonna sound like i'm talking about star wars now that's a third jar um <laughs> that jar is overflowing that... <laughs> it's, it's the jar 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 all will. right that, that's a th- fourth jar where i bring up jar jar banks i have to put a lot of money in there <laughs> But it makes the whole mythos of Alien feel smaller when the implicit point of this franchise, I feel like, is to broaden the scope 
of the ge- world that we're in, the universe that we're in, because that's what you're doing when you have all the unanswered questions about the space jockey and the alien egg farm that are in the first alien or even just the concept of every movie alien switches genres and up until this movie i think that's been true and this movie's genre i guess i guess it kind of is this movie's genre is legacy sequel which is okay we emulate the tone of the previous entry like it's like you know your classic force awakens conundrum where it's like, yeah. okay, we're just doing that one again, I guess. With you guys, you guys liked it when we did that one, right? And then we'll we'll throw a little bit of the second one in because you guys like that one too. And there you go. That's your there's your legacy sequel. We got a young white brunette woman. <laughs> she she's good to go. Yeah, you've got honestly, you've got a lot of similar elements casting wise in Romulus. You've got your <laughs> well, that's really true, actually. Yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> about that now. Your your young uh, African American male companion and uh, the who is third... way more into who's way more into her than it's, she's yeah, into him. yeah, for sure. And then you have your vaguely uh, Hispanic, I guess, uh, <laughs> other. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, even though he no, was, like, true. clearly British, but also the guy's name was Bjorn as well. I don't know. It's a multicultural mixing pot of corporate oppression on whatever colony they are in. Yes. it. Uh, it I'm trying to remember. It was, like, it was a good name. I remember when yeah, they yeah. said the name, I was like, that's a good name. It's, like, Johnson's Star or something. Yeah. I almost wondered if it was uh, some kind of tie-in to... I mean, I only just started playing Alien Isolation, the Sevastopol uh, station yep. stuff, it's the emergency Jackson's station. Star, but oh yeah, Jackson and they also Star, had yeah. Jackson Star. I just looked it up. They also had the emergency stations from Alien Isolation in this. Yeah, movie. yeah. I, I thought that was cool, like the production design. Totally. Rad. I don't mind that of like taking the assets from disparate parts of the Wayland Utani corporation portrayed in different media and putting them all in this i think that's cool and alvarez has said it in the same interview actually where he was talking about the, the, thinking about the kids from aliens he was talking about how he loves alien isolation and wanted to bring the tone of alien isolation to the big screen and and buddy i've got some news for you because the tone of alien isolation is in fact derivative of the tone of the original alien i don't know if you heard about that <laughs> I, no i never heard of it so yeah. i mean i yeah. i you know it's all it's all mixed in there and i i honestly feel like if i'm if i'm boiling romulus down i think the good mostly outweighs the mediocre of this movie i think i would watch it again i think it's as at least as good as the other alien sequels after aliens and again it ends in a vague enough way that i wouldn't be disappointed at all if the next you know a- alien remus and it's about it's you know mm-hmm. half a prequel about the crew who catches the meteor and half like what is rain doing with with uh, all the other stuff she's got going on i i wouldn't be disappointed at all as i speculated at the end of last episode the the really the terminator dark fate of the alien franchise yes i uh, i was thinking about you saying that after the credits started rolling on romulus and i was like you know what accurate very accurate so should we talk uh, a little bit more about the horrible use of ian holm in our pop culture reference let's do it For today's pop culture reference, we're going to be talking about digital resurrection. The use of CGI to touch up actors and their performances in film is almost as old as the technology that made the practice possible. But the more recent trend of resurrecting deceased actors, often through AI-aided programs, has proliferated at a frankly alarming rate. In 1999, the state of California passed the Astaire Celebrity Image Protection Act, which defends celebrities' likenesses after their death. This came after a campaign sparked by Fred Astaire's widow, who was appalled at an ad campaign featuring the late entertainer digitally altered to be dancing with a dust devil vacuum cleaner. Since then, the use of an actor's likeness after their death has been a question of legal permission from the estate of the deceased. 
but after that permission is granted, filmmakers often lean on the on-screen portfolio and archival footage of the person to reconstruct an adequate performance. Using this method, Marlon Brando appeared in Superman Returns in 2006, two years after his death, and Laurence Olivier made a brief posthumous cameo in the 2004 pulp sci-fi film Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, with both of these appearances being generally well accepted for being project appropriate and not overstaying their welcome on screen, serving more as a tribute to the late actor's legacies than shameless reanimation. If an actor passes away while actively filming a project, the already shot and cut footage is often re-edited and rewritten to create as much of a well-rounded character resolution as possible, while also finishing any vital unshot scenes utilizing heavier shadows, facial obstructions, practical facial prosthetics, and as few close-up shots as possible of the body double. Brandon Lee in The Crow and Oliver Reed in Gladiator both unfortunately had to have their roles finished using this minimally computer-generated method. For roles like that of Paul Walker in Furious 7 and Carrie Fisher in The Rise of Skywalker, family members that bear a striking resemblance to the deceased are often cast to finish the film with the correct face mapped onto theirs for tighter continuity and more seamless close-up shots. Another Star Wars film, Rogue One, kickstarted the trend of fully resurrecting dead actors with digital technology to reprise iconic roles in big-budget franchises. Some recreated characters, like Peter Cushing's Grand Moff Tarkin, are more integral to a story that acts as a direct prequel, like Rogue One, but more out-of-touch filmmakers sometimes use the digital recreations of actors as their well-known characters through AI to generate nostalgia or produce shock in an audience as was the case for the poorly received Christopher Reeve cameo in the 2023 Flash movie, and the ghost of Harold Ramis's Egon in Ghostbusters Afterlife in 2021. Today's main segment, Alien Romulus, uses many of these methods to create a replicated android counterpart of Ian Holmes' character from the original 1979 Alien, including life-size puppeteering, CGI, archival footage, and, unfortunately, generative AI to recreate Holmes' face and voice. By creating a full-size puppet, director Fede Alvarez hoped to minimize the use of unnecessary CGI like many other decisions he made for the film, but the choice to also map Holmes' likeness over actor Daniel Betts' face and motion performance through the use of generative AI seems to negate much of that practical special effects goodwill. We talked very extensively in our main segment about how unhappy we were with the Ian Holm resurrection method that they were using here. And I know Fede Alvarez did a lot of work in the practical effects in Romulus with the gore, the aliens themselves. A lot of the set is just like, it's very well done in real life. I just think it's such a bungle, really fumbling it on the 99, well, maybe not the 99 yard line, but like, a lot I closer. Say not, <laughs> it, it would have. I, I think this would have been easily. I think I mentioned this in the main segment. Easily, it would have been the third best Alien movie if it if it relied less on just how bugged out the Rook character looks because of this AI method that was used. I similarly love Rogue One. I think it is close to being, if not definitively, the the most consistent. Star Wars, uh, Disney era movie. And something that bums me out every single time I revisit it is that CGI Peter Cushing. When there were so many great actors, I've, I've said this once on the show, I've said it a hundred times. It should have been Charles Dance. I don't know why it, it wasn't Charles Dance. It should have been Charles Dance. It really, really should have been. And I know there are a lot of filmmakers use a lot of excuses or whatever about the the type of performance that they're trying to achieve without somebody that they were working with actively. And I know that can be incredibly hard to recreate, but it just, it, it, the soullessness of an AI generated image or an AI generated voice that even if you get it very close, like honestly, the, the Tarkin in Rogue One looks pretty solid for what it is, but it just, it takes away from the entire package when, when you see something like that. And I do occasionally, and I don't think this is even fair, 
But I do occasionally do some hand waving on Rogue One where I'm like, it was clearly them trying to see if they could. It was a real Jurassic Park, you know. Yes. Your scientists yes. were so preoccupied and that yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm only, I'm a little willing to let it slide. I think that though is more on how much I like Rogue One and wanting to be cool with it more than it is me actually being cool with it and. A lot of the time, like you were saying, filmmakers come up with excuses like, well, the estate was cool with it. And I I read when doing research on Romulus that Ian Holmes' widow was really excited that they asked uh, about his likeness because apparently in the last few years of his life, Holmes was having a really hard time getting acting gigs. And to me, that's even more sinister because it's like, to Hollywood, you are worth more dead than alive. Yeah, that it, it's creepy. It's upsetting. I, I think that is a trend that I wish wouldn't be so prevalent. But like we mentioned up top on this reference, it is it, we see it more and more every year. And it really does suck with the amount of legacy sequels and reboots and references that we know studios are trying to sell to us. And they're going to keep using that method as long as people are buying tickets. And they're going to wrap it in like, oh, don't you want to see the new new alien don't you want to see the new star wars and it's it's just never gonna feel better i i think there's no world where i get used to that method and also i think it's worth noting and we didn't include this as much in the meat of the reference but this technology was really pioneered for advertising even after the the fred astaire stuff there were in the early 2010s several commercials that featured resurrected dead golden age celebrities Mm. like grace kelly marlena dietrich marilyn monroe and audrey hepburn and one i think the way that all of those women were treated by hollywood was gross and then their visages being dug up to be further exploited for the explicit purpose of advertising for money is really gross but then that being channeled into major hollywood films i think speaks all the more to the way that Hollywood has exclusively become like this giant advertising money machine and that what little humanity there is left on projects that I do think have like real good gritty heart put into them like Rogue One like Alien Romulus of filmmakers that are trying to make it work within these giant budget franchises being steamrolled by this really unfortunate practice. Yeah, and and the the biggest trick of it all is that a tasteful recast would be infinitely better in pretty much every single role that I've seen that has been Mm -hmm. a CGI AI resurrection, and studios just won't hear that. I know they won't hear that. They'll say, well, we've got the go-ahead, we've got the thumbs up from his kids, we're giving them a bunch of money, why wouldn't we use our billion dollar computers to make our audience feel uncomfortable? It's all Solo's fault, dude. Solo didn't make any money, and now they will never recast. Uh, Like, not just Disney, but they will never... Hollywood will never recast an iconic role again. Uh, I... I, There are... (laughs) When we see like AI generated versions of living people like Mark Hamill and Arnold Schwarzenegger too. It's just like, there's no hope for anyone. Apparently it's, it's very (laughs) upsetting. I don't like that. I'm not a supporter of it. I do think it's less gross because like, Carrie Fisher at the end of Rogue One. She was alive to say, I'm cool with that. Sure, yeah. You know, and I think, you know, we, we've brought up Terminator Dark Fate for some reason several times on the show today. <laughs> for some um, reason. I actually think that that movie uses de-aging technology very effectively, but it's also for one very short scene. What, weirdly enough, I was actually referencing uh, Terminator Salvation, I believe, is the one with the weird oh, CGI Arnold that he wasn't yeah, ever on set totally. for. Yeah. That doesn't need to be in that movie. At all, <laughs> other than really like, just like you clap because you know what that is. And um, my biggest point for the living people, I mean, I'm glad they get to see and, and sign off on things, but it's more like that's just showing that they are rubbing their hands waiting for these people to die and that they've already got everything that they need to run wild once that they can't give the go-ahead they can't sign off on things Mm -hmm. they're assuming that whatever estate uh, is holding those rights is just going to be fine getting more money that they know what to do with and then we're going to get really nasty stuff for the rest of our favorite franchises And there have been lots of A-list actors like Robin Williams, Susan Sarandon, and Tom Cruise 
who have been very vocal about their disdain for this practice and have been really good about making sure that their likenesses can't be exploited posthumously. Williams, I think, who is the only one of the three I just mentioned that's actually passed away, though only has a statute of limitations of 70 years. And just because they, as some of the biggest entertainers on the planet, have the power to make sure that that doesn't happen to them. Like, Ian Holm, an amazing actor. He's in tons of iconic, great films. I don't think he has the power to make sure that that's not going to happen to him. Even if his widow hadn't signed off on it, you think the Holm estate has the money to take on Disney? Yeah, that exactly. There's There's little to stop these studios from steamrolling that kind of litigation on rights and to call back on whatever contracts have been signed over a lifetime of work to ensure that they will have a stronghold on a catalog of ghosts that they're just going to be putting in movies till the end of time. It's just, it's just nasty. I hope that there is some kind of kibosh put on that practice as soon as possible, but I know that that's just, it's profitable enough to stifle that until it's out of control, which it is swiftly becoming. So I, yeah. Negative public opinion did seemingly quash. You remember there was that news story a couple of years ago that there was going to be a fully CGI recreated James Dean starring in a new movie. Yes, I do. Okay, that is, I mean, that is true. And then, you know, do you, you chip away at that enough and then you go, well, James Dean is the only non-AI generated star that's not in movies anymore. And then and it, uh, piece by piece, the dominoes will fall, I think. Uh, I mean, it's it's the exact same corporate mentality that got us to swallow entertainment monopolies because people like superheroes. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Superman, Christopher Reeve, uh, Nick Cage, who apparently like had no idea what he was even oh. doing in that movie, too. Like, my God. Again, I think it's less gross because Nick Cage is still alive, but I still think it's horrible because he hated that. And yeah, he, it was exactly. not, and like you yeah. said, was not told what it was going to be. Ugh. Well, whenever <laughs> I call it, yeah, tune back in for our next legacy sequel slash reboot when we talk about this exact same thing again, uh, probably. Hey, boyo, oh, two weeks from now it is, uh, is, uh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice? Uh, oh. Definitely will not have <laughs> creepy, uh, DH Gina Davis uh, and Alec Baldwin in it, right? But before and we go that's... any far down that horrible AI rabbit hole, why, what do you say? We kick it on over and save the AI rec center. Let's save it. Save the rec center! Now it's time to save the rec center, where we give you our weekly recommendations. Garrett, what do you got for me this week? I've got a video game for you, Seamus. I don't know if you've ever heard of video games. Never heard Um, of what you got for me. I have been... Uh, feverishly, with with all of my ample spare time that you're familiar <laughs> with, playing, I'm a little late to the party, I don't think anybody's gonna be surprised to hear that I've been really enjoying Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, I am yeah. like 16 hours into it or something, and um, it's really, f- I'm not an RPG guy, really, video game wise, I like a tabletop RPG, and this, it has all of the pleasures of playing, not all of the pleasures, it has many of the pleasures of playing a D&D campaign without being, and this, not to imply that D&D campaigns are this way, but a lot of video games that attempt to replicate the feeling of playing a D&D campaign are tedious and boring, and it has just the right amount of me having to spend time in menus, just a little <laughs> bit like i don't want to i don't want to spend a ton of time in the menu but i also do want to have to think about like oh what boots do i want my guy to wear and it's got that it's got dice rolls when it matters but not to the point that i'm annoyed by them it has a compelling cast of fun characters i think it's something that technology has made possible for a long time but i don't think it's something that people have really figured out how to do very well yet which is unlike a lot of open world games it gives me actual choices 
to make and not just like oh yeah you can go anywhere but there's like one place for you to go and the rest of the world is is like either too hard for you to combat or whatever like and there is a linear element to the story but it definitely lets me tackle things in the order in which i want to tackle them Mm. it lets me choose which party members i want to go with instead of sticking me with a bunch of npcs i don't care about the whole thing is just exactly what I hoped it would be, and I'm glad that I took the chance on it. I took, with PlayStation Plus, I had my free, like, two-hour game trial or whatever, and I played enough of it to be like, okay, yes, I actually would enjoy this. I picked it up during the PlayStation Summer Sale for, like, 50 bucks or something, and I am definitely getting my money's worth. I did the. I also played that trial that was on, on the PS Plus, and I thought it was a phenomenal style of game. That's not, like, that isometric kind of uh, camera angle isn't usually the RPGs that I go for, but I can't agree with you more. It's, it's The combat is so unique, and it really does give you enough of that real table top energy to to feel like it you know i will definitely take this recommendation as soon as that deluxe edition isn't like a million dollars if i'm you know but i know that it's big enough to warrant that kind of price point uh you could probably play it for like hundreds of hours is what i've heard and i i can't wait to see your character then when i go over there at some point i i'm very oh, curious you i think you will enjoy Seamus. i think he's a fun <laughs> he's a fun guy Lovely. um and it will also stave me off from buying the new star wars game for like maybe oh, another good. week, I guess. Good like I'm, I, I am so whipped for Star Wars. It's sad <laughs> that I'm still. I'm like, I know that if I buy it, it'll just be a glitchy mess. But also, <laughs> I see people online in the Mos Eisley Cantina, and I'm like, I would also like to be doing that. Yes. Uh, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. But I, I, I admire your will to to hit the. <laughs> <laughs> the golden oldie gem that is <laughs> Baldur's Gate 3 first in the meantime. Uh, yes, I really, I'm really diving b- back into the classics here. <laughs> Ret- you know. Retro is what we call it, yeah, yeah. But what do you have to save the rec center this week, Seamus? I had the pleasure of going to the 3D re-release of the Leica classic Coraline, and I have always been a fan of this movie since the first time I saw it in crappy red and blue lens 3D when it came out originally. And I gotta say, it it holds up better than any movie maybe of my entire childhood. I still think to this day it's maybe the best animated movie ever made. It's horrifying. Way Every time you rewatch it, it's way more horrifying than you remember. It's absolutely stunning gorgeous. I don't know how much longer the anniversary re-release is even out for, but if 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 this is anything, if just a reminder to rewatch it at home, I I urge you to take it because it is phenomenal. I'm very curious. I wanted to catch that re-release, but it was in theaters so fleetingly. Mm, yeah, I'm curious if this new like 3D enhancement that they've done because i know it originally came out in 3d but they did like a new pass of the i don't know how that kind of technology works but yeah it's a better 3d experience now i'm very curious if there is an intention to get that i don't even know how you could watch 3d i don't own a 3d tv is that what i would have to do is is maybe buy a 3d tv which companies don't make anymore but i mean regardless i i think that's a stellar like Coraline alone is a stellar enough rec center uh, without oh, yeah. 3D elements, so and I, I with the success, hopefully the success of this anniversary release, some of the uh, lesser sung Leica films, maybe we'll get a, a pass in that real D 3D as well. Kubo, I've Kubo, never seen Kubo in the Two Strings. How messed up is that? But maybe it's the, really messed up, Shavis, because I, that the 4K is sitting on my shelf. I know, I you know, right dude. Now. I I. I will watch it. My my Leica thirst is renewed after seeing Coraline again. And I just again, if you ha- it's been a while, please please go give it another shot. I- I'll I'll have to pop it on sometime soon, Shavis for sure. But that wraps us up for our show this week. If you want to reach the show on social media, that's at PCR underscore podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. If you want to email the show directly, that's popculturereferencepod at gmail.com. Next week, the juice is loose, babe. <laughs> As we are covering, in anticipation of its 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 sequel, the original, the, the best, the GOAT, 
Beetlejuice. I am thrilled. I'm always thrilled to to do a rewatch. Uh, we, this is a a Keaton cast, if anything. I certainly I cannot wait for a, a long discussion about Beetlejuice as a snake banister, famously in that one part. <laughs> There's no time that a Beetlejuice rewatch is unwelcome, uh, much unlike the, the ghost himself. If, oh, of course. I completely agreed. Well, I'm looking forward to talking with uh, Otho and all of his colorful cast of friends <laughs> next week. <laughs> Hell yeah. I can't lie about your adios, but you have my amigos. <laughs>